start, I want to mention uh, one or two things. Uh, first off, about grading. Um, I had intended to get caught up on grading over the long weekend. Um, my wife had different plans for my time. Uh, so our backyard's nice and clear of sticks, but I didn't get the grading done. Um, <clears throat> I had, uh, <clears throat> not that this really makes you feel all warm and fuzzy, I'm sure, but I finished grading all my NP2 classes. Um, I'll, I'm glad your yard doesn't Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, <clears throat> when I'm grading, I go into each individual course and I can pull up a page that has what needs to be graded. And the way I do it is um, <clears throat> I kind of start randomly from one end of the classes or the other. Um, and it just happens to be when I was doing the grading, I started with the A&P2 classes. Um, and so I got all those done, and I'm to my a p one classes. This morning I was trying to get on top of some of the grading, um, and I graded most of the class that just finished, because I wanted to get it done for them. Um, and I was hoping to get the grading to yours also. I didn't, <clears throat> obviously. Um, so that's, uh, I have a couple more left over from my earlier class just to get them off um, the list of classes that you do. And then I'll move on to yours tomorrow. So I should have your grading done tomorrow. Um, I am, uh, one of my colleagues is giving a test to one of her classes tomorrow and um, <clears throat> She can't be there, so she's asked me to proctor the test because I'm free during that time. So I'll be stuck in a classroom watching other people take some test uh, that I don't know anything about. Uh, so I have some time to kill. I'm going to bring one of my Chromebooks in, and I'll work on grading while I'm doing that. So hopefully I'll be able to get to the grading for you guys by then. Um, I will not get to the um, uh, muscle videos tomorrow because I don't think it would be quite appropriate for me to be watching your videos while people are trying to take a test in the class. So, um, but I should get everything else graded in your class tomorrow. Uh, of course, I've made those kind of promises before, not just to you, but to lots of classes, and I don't get around to doing it. But uh, I have a lot of confidence because I've got to sit in this room for an hour and a half anyway, so I should be able to get the stuff done. Um, also, I just want to remind you where we are in the semester. Um, this is the last chapter that you have chapter assignments for. Next week, we're going to be covering uh, one more chapter, but there aren't assignments associated with that. Um, now, actually, this isn't a chapter uh, that we're dealing with. It's actually over a couple of chapters, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, the assignments in this folder here um, are the last part one, two, three, and four assignments. Um, there's also a lab quiz here. Um, <clears throat> there's a lab quiz that was in last week's folder, um, but we didn't finish the lab material last week. We didn't get to the lab material last week. Spent all day, all last class talking about the electrical activity stuff. Um, <clears throat> and so that lab material is actually what we're going to be doing today. It's actually why you have the brain models in front of you. Um, so there's a lab quiz um, in last week's folder that's due next week because a push the due date back wasn't going to be done in time. Um, so you do have lab, lab quiz still to do, and then we're going to look at the material for this lab quiz today. Um, what I've done in the past for the material that this lab quiz is about, it says cranial nerves. Um, <clears throat> I have in the past spent a lot of time on that material. I'm not doing that anymore because what I cover in that lab is what I cover in the book. So I'm going to talk about some of that stuff um, briefly and sort of highlight some of the things I want to stress, but not go in as much detail as I would, which is good because we don't really have time to do that today. Um, <clears throat> but we will cover this stuff today also. So the lab quiz from last week, we're going to actually finish that material up to, in the first half today. And then the lab quiz, quiz from this week, that material will be what we do in the second part of what we do in the second half today. Um, <clears throat> and then next week, uh, it says that there's lab material. There's not a lab um, uh, quiz to go with it. Um, but uh, we'll do some stuff next week too. 
<clears throat> now, about the fact that this isn't really a chapter assignment, this nervous system material here is really looking at a couple of chapters worth of material. Um, so in unit three here, uh, the second chapter, which is called Anatomy of the Nervous System, and the third chapter, which is called the Somatic Nervous System, is really the topic for tonight. Um, <clears throat> the anatomy stuff obviously is about anatomy. Um, and then the um, <clears throat> somatic nervous system chapter is essentially the physiology, the function of the uh, nervous system. There's two chapters, one called somatic nervous system, one called autonomic nervous system, because there's two aspects to the function um, that I've separated out into two chapters. And the reason I separated them into two chapters is because we're doing somatic nervous system this semester, and then the autonomic nervous system is a topic for AP2. Um, so we'll be looking at the whole st structure of the nervous system tonight um, and concentrating just on the somatic functions, the uh, things that are about conscious perception and um, uh, voluntary responses. And then next semester we'll get into the uh, homeostatic mechanisms and the function therein, which is the autonomic system. Next week uh, we'll be looking at uh, material in this chapter, which is called the neurological exam. Um, just to be sure everybody's clear on this, we are not taking an exam next week. The topic is called neurological exam because it's a clinical examination. Okay, um, I just want to be as emphatic about that because I've had students freak out and email me the night before saying, "What's the exam we have tomorrow?" Something like that. There's not a test tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. There's not a test next week. Um, we're going to be talking about this clinical examination thing. It's basically the same material that we're addressing tonight, but looking at it from a clinical perspective. Um, and so we'll continue a little bit about what we're, uh, we're doing tonight next week. Uh, there's just not additional assignments that have to do with that. Uh, and then, of course, the week after that is uh, the final class meeting, which is our ostensibly our final exam period, but we'll be taking the um, second uh, practical in-class portion. Um, that's all we're doing that night, so uh, we'll start obviously at 5.30. Uh, you might very well be out of here by 6.30. I'll be kicking everybody out at 7.30. Um, you only get two hours to complete that. So um, <clears throat> again, that's two weeks from tonight, whatever that would be the six? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, that's where things are going now. Um, the first section of this chapter is the embryological perspective. And so I want to talk about this a little bit um, before we get into looking at the, the models too much. Um, but this will set up understanding what we're looking at in the models. Um, the nervous system is rather complex. and uh, one way of approaching its anatomy is to start with what it looks like at the, uh, in the embryo. And as we consider how it gets more complex in embryonic development, uh, we can start to see how the different parts are related together. Um, <clears throat> this is really kind of the way that I was introduced to the nervous system structure, and so I think it's a really powerful <laughs> way um, to understand it. Um, when I was doing research in graduate school, um, I was looking at how a certain part of the brain develops, so I was very familiar with the embryology. And from that, I got a, <clears throat> a better understanding of, of its overall anatomy. Okay. Um, so at its simplest, the nervous system starts as just a tube. Um, I was actually going to pull up, try to pull up a video to show you, uh, because this is a dynamic process. It kind of helps to see it in video of what, what's happening. But, um, early on in embryonic development, the embryo is just separated out into a few simple types of tissue. Um, and one of those tissues is essentially the outer covering. It's called the ectoderm. Um, it's the tissue that's going to make up the skin, the outer covering of your body, but it's also what makes up the nervous system. Uh, there's a point in neurological development when the... Um, Ectoderm differentiates into two different 
things uh, are really, a lot of it stays ectoderm and then one particular area differentiates into this more specific neurectoderm, which is the part, sorry, neurectoderm, which is the part that's going to become the um, nervous system. Um, the cells don't look any different at the beginning. They're all just <coughs> run in the middle ectoderm cells, whatever that happens to look like. <coughs> but some of those cells are induced to start changing. Um, and in their changing, they, they take on different shapes, which ends up making the outer covering of the embryo change a little bit. And I think this picture, yeah. So this picture depicts it a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> so the drawing up here is just sort of the overall shape of the embryo. Um, <clears throat> and the ectoderm is the outer covering part. The other parts, the other tissue inside is not what we're talking about here. Um, right along the midline, so up here where this line is, um, the tissue starts to change into this neurectoderm, and the cells change shape, which makes it fold in on itself. Um, and the two edges of the fold, the neural fold, come together, which is called convergence, forming a little tube. Okay, so this middle picture is kind of showing when the tube first sort of separates off. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into it too much. It's uh, not relevant to the basic understanding of the nervous system. But these little yellow dots that we see off the other side, which are labeled as the neural crest off here in the next picture, um, that's some of the tissue where the neural fold comes together um, at convergence. Some of the cells completely separate out. Um, and they become other components of uh, the nervous system and some other tissues that are associated with the nervous system later on. But what we're interested in is just this tube right here. Or here we see it finally. The ectoderm over top has all sort of healed up from that um, infolding. Um, and this is what's going to become the skin later on. Uh, and so the neural tube in the middle here is what's going to become the nervous system. Um, <clears throat> so at its simplest, it's just a tube. Now, it's an important point to make here that the tube is hollow. So when it's a fold, the two edges of the fold come together, and the empty space in the middle is uh, sort of retained in there. What we're going to see is that empty space is uh, maintained through the nervous system up until adulthood. And in fact, the other model that I had you grab, the little um, gray thing, um, this is a model of part of what that empty space in the middle of the tube ends up looking like. So I'll come back to that one. Um, <clears throat> We're talking about the adult brain structures. Um, <clears throat> the tube then starts to uh, specialize and differentiate along its length. At the anterior end, which is going to eventually develop into the head of the embryo anyways, that's where the brain develops. And at the posterior end, um, that's where the spinal cord develops. As the anterior end is specializing, differentiating, um, we can look at it at two different time points. One where we see what are called the primary vesicles, and the other when we see the secondary vesicles. Um, and looking at these two time points and the vesicles that we see uh, helps us start to understand <clears throat> how the brain is going to be organized at, in the adult situation. Okay, so this is a picture that looks at the uh, two <laughs> vesicle stages. First, when they're primary vesicles, there's only three of them. Uh, we have a lateral view of the anterior portion of the tube, and then it looks like the tube's been cut off at the end here because what goes on from here, the rest of it's just the posterior part. Um, so what's cut off and this kind of off-white color hair area here, that's what's going to be the spinal cord. And the colored regions in here is what's going to become the brain. And the first thing that happens in this development, the tube starts to thicken out or bulge out in a couple of places, and that's these are the two, the primary vesicles that we're talking about. Now, as we're talking about these primary vesicles, their names all are in Greek, and they have a prefix and um, the word encephalon. Um, 
Seth means head. So n Seth means in the head, or essentially the brain. Um, so for all of these, encephalon is just referring to the brain. And then the prefix is telling us which part of the brain it is. The word prosencephalon um, uh, translated from the Greek pretty much exactly means forebrain. Okay. And then mesencephalon means midbrain. Uh, and then rhombencephalon does not actually mean hindbrain, but that's uh, the um, <clears throat> relevant word here. So just as we're talking about the brain, it's separated into these three different regions, the front part, the middle part, and the hind part. Now, in some ways of looking at the brain, this is how the organization is considered. Um, but we're going to move on to the secondary section, which is the five words we see on the side over there, um, as it gets a little bit more complex, because um, this isn't a really good representation of how the adult brain is laid out so much. Um, <clears throat> but it is useful to understand that the forebrain is the anterior most part of the neural tube, followed by the midbrain and the hindbrain, which is then connected to the spinal cord that goes out posteriorly from that. Um, but <clears throat> looking at these three levels, you might think that midbrain is sort of one-third of the brain. There is a structure in the adult, which is called the midbrain, which is essentially the mesencephalon. It's a very small part of the adult brain. And <clears throat> here, that's not so obvious because it seems to be a significant portion of what we have here. But really what's going to happen is the hindbrain and the forebrain are going to develop much more kind of overshadow the midbrain. And part of that process is what happens in the formation of the secondary vesicles, of which there are five. Um, the prosencephalon separates into or bulges out into two different regions called the telencephalon and the diencephalon. Um, <clears throat> and then the mesencephalon doesn't really change too much, and it's still called the mesencephalon. And then the rhomencephalon separates into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Now, <clears throat> here on the screen, we basically see um, eight different Greek words. Don't worry about the Greek words except for one of them. All of the rest of these words uh, we use the English equivalent for. So prosencephalon, mesencephalon, robencephalon are forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Obviously mesencephalon in the secondary brain vesicle stage is still the midbrain. Um, the telencephalon, the metencephalon, and the myelencephalon are all going to have um, <clears throat> more common names in the adult situation. So we don't really use those too often. There's not a good English equivalent to diencephalon. So we'll continue using diencephalon um, when we're talking about the adult brain. So that's the only Greek word that you're really going to need to um, maintain here. So um, the telencephalon makes up what we call the cerebrum. As you're looking at the... Um, uh, brain model, the cerebrum is the big wrinkly part on the outside. Okay. Not the smaller wrinkly part on the back, just the big wrinkly part that makes up most of the brain. Um, <clears throat> it is hollow in the center, but not as hollow as that picture is suggesting. What's going to happen after the secondary <laughs> brain stage, uh, <laughs> vesicle stage, is the walls of these vesicles are going to get thicker and thicker and more and more neurons are going to grow and develop. Um, but there'll still be a little bit of empty space in the middle. Um, and that empty space in the middle is what this other model is uh, representing. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, the cerebrum is more than just what we see here on the outer surface. What, we're, what you're looking at, the outer covering of the cerebrum, is referred to as the cerebral, I mean, the cerebral cortex. Okay. Um, but deep underneath that, there's white matter and gray matter and different uh, structures within that are still part of the cerebrum. And some of those we'll talk about tonight and some of them uh, I'll talk about more next week. Then the diencephalon, this next part here, is um, 
kind of easily described as anything that has thalamus in its name, which includes the thing called the thalamus, and then there's a hypothalamus and an epithalamus listed here. Now the thalamus and the hypothalamus are going to be important things we'll be talking about quite a bit in this course. Um, and so I want to introduce what those terms are. Epithalamus is something that we'll be talking about at the beginning of AMP2, but we actually won't use the name epithalamus with that. Um, <clears throat> uh, the more common name for what the epithalamus is is the pineal gland, if you've ever heard of that. If you haven't heard of that, you get to look forward to something in AMP2. Um, but its formal name is that, and so it sort of fits in with the diencephalon. Um, <clears throat> now, there's another thing in the diencephalon that's labeled there that obviously doesn't have thalamus in its name. That's the eye cup. Um, in the lateral view there, you can see the telencephalon, which is light blue, and the diencephalon, which is, well, <laughs> not as light blue color there. Um, sort of look like that's the head part of this embryo worm, whatever we're looking at here. And the eye cup looks like an eye. And in fact, that's going to be the eye. It grows out of the brain right there. Um, it's going to eventually become the retina of the uh, fully mature eye, um, which is interesting to note because uh, it will, <clears throat> as you learn about the eye in NP2, um, you're going to think of it more as a peripheral structure, part of the peripheral nervous system. When in fact it's really part of the central nervous system that breaks the rule of being contained within the um, cranial or vertebral uh, cavities. It's actually outside the cranial cavity, it's in the orbit, but um, embryologically it started life as part of the um, central nervous system. And there are some quirks about the retina and the optic nerve um, that make it different from other things in the periphery. And that's because it really started as a central nervous system structure. Um, <clears throat> the reason I like to point this out, and it's a good example of why thinking about embryology is important to start with, is when you learn about the eye and where it's connected, it's connected to things and other things than the diencephalon. Um, so the major... Uh, amount of visual information that we process that we're um, consciously aware of is processed through the thalamus. The retina projects to the thalamus, synapses on thalamic neurons. And then the thalamus connects to uh, the cerebral cortex where we process visual information. Um, and then the hypothalamus is where we process a lot of visual information that's not conscious. So um, it reflects uh, receives information from the retina that it uses to regulate pupillary size, and it also sends it on then to the epithalamus, which is responsible for our internal clock, knowing whether it's night or day. And when it's day, sunlight is hitting um, uh, the retina, and that information goes to the hypothalamus, which then sends it to the epithalamus, so the epithalamus lets you know that it's daytime outside. And um, when I say that we see sunlight, I don't necessarily mean that it's this bright sunny day, even outside right now. Our brain knows that it's daytime. Um, the sun is up there, and it's shining through the clouds. Um, it's darker than we'd like, but the light is um, a broad-spectrum light. Um, <coughs> was it in your class last week when I was saying that you're sitting in a green room? I said it to you guys? Okay, I said it to you but, um, Light has, uh, no, how should I say this? Color comes from the frequency of light waves that are hitting our retina. Um, sunlight is broad spectrum light, which means all the different colors are represented there. Uh, if you've ever seen a rainbow, a rainbow is because the different wavelengths of light that are coming from the sun get refracted through uh, water droplets in the air uh, in, at different angles. So it, it breaks up the spectrum. You can see the individual colors there. But all of those colors that are in the rainbow are contained within sunlight. Okay? And our brain recognizes that. We can process all those different colors. Other lights, like the lights up here above us, are narrow spectrum lights. They send out information 
I mean, send out wavelengths of light uh, that are limited. And the lights above us are actually colored green. Um, you probably don't recognize that because you have a brain. Uh, what the brain does is it automatically um, subtracts out the background color because you know what color certain things are supposed to be. You have a piece of paper in front of you and your brain knows that that's supposed to be white. The green wavelength light coming from the fluorescent lights above us reflects off that light and hits our, I mean, reflects off the page and hits our uh, retina. But our brain knows that it's supposed to be a white piece of paper, so it just subtracts out the um, uh, green wavelengths. And so you don't consciously perceive this as a green light, but it really is a green light. Um, the uh, slowly being phased out light bulb kind of thing that you might have at home, what we call an incandescent light, um, it's also narrow spectrum. It's more of an orangey yellow color. Um, and if you've ever taken a picture with your phone or with film uh, that you didn't use a flash on and it came out underexposed and has that kind of orangey yellowish color to it, that's the color of the lights. Your brain, again, subtracts out that color because it knows that it's not natural light. And you perceive things as if it's under that color. Um, so, uh, even when it's cloudy outside, your brain knows that it's daylight because there's broad spectrum sunlight filtering through the clouds. And that information gets sent to the hypothalamus, which then the hypothalamus lets the epithalamus know that it's daylight outside, or if there's no sun shining, that um, it's nighttime outside. And um, the epithalamus releases a hormone signal that lets your body know when it's nighttime versus daytime. Um, and hormones are a topic of AMP too. But the point there, uh, the eye cup connects to the thalamus and hypothalamus primarily, which makes sense because they develop out of the same part of the embryonic brain. Um, and so uh, as we talk about adult function in the brain, you, it'll be more obvious to you that vision is processed through the diencephalon before it's processed anywhere else because the eyes connected there. That's the point. Um, the mesencephalon continues to just be the midbrain. And even at this stage, which is about five weeks into embryonic development, it looks like a pretty significant portion of the brain. But in actuality, in the adult, the midbrain is really quite small. So if you take your brain model, and if you're sharing yours with somebody else, you take half and have the other person look at the other half. Um, <clears throat> right here, there's this, um, there should be a thing that has like two little bumps. Okay? Um, and in this hard plastic model, the two little bumps aren't that obvious, but it's right there. Okay? That's where the midbrain's located. Okay? Now, what I'm covering up with the tip of my finger right now, that's the midbrain. It's just that little piece right in there. Okay? It ends up being a very small part of the adult brain, but in the embryonic development, it looks kind of big because uh, everything else hasn't uh, outgrown it yet. There. So that's where the midbrain is. Now I'll come back, back to talking about some of these structures. Oh, actually, no. while we have this out, and I'm talking about these things, let me back up to the diencephalon. Um, <coughs> You can see the cerebral cortex on the outside, like I said before, and even looking at the half brain, you can see that cortex extending down sort of on the inside of on midline. There's this big white um, <clears throat> sort of C-shaped structure right here, which is sort of at the edge of <coughs> the wrinkly part of the cerebral cortex. And then below that, on the hard plastic brain, there's another piece of um, something that's colored white. On the um, uh, squishy brain, um, <laughs> so here's that C-shaped thing, the squishy brain. Um, and then uh, on one side, it's labeled 12. Um, it's not colored white here. Um, but that's the uh, other piece of white that I'm pointing out in this hard plastic brain. Um, <clears throat> So I'm just orienting you to this stuff. Below that 
hard white plastic thing and the thing that's labeled out of 12 on the um, uh, squishy plastic brain. Uh, right here in the middle of the brain, there's a structure that has a bump on it. In the hard plastic brain, it has a yellow bump. In the squishy plastic brain, it has a brown bump. Okay? That's the thalamus. The bump is where one thalamus touches the other thalamus. And there's a little space between them except where a little bit from one side meets up with a little bit from the other side. They're about the size of the end of your thumb. So as I'm demonstrating this, I'm using my thumbs like that because that's kind of the size they really are. So they just barely touch right there at minimum, but there's actually a little bit of space between them for the most part. Where they touch is where that little colored dot is, the yellow or brown dot. Um, I think on both of them it's pretty obvious. There's a little groove uh, sort of outlining this the thalamus structure right there. Um, kind of below the groove and a little bit anterior to it, where that area kind of comes to a point, that's the hypothalamus. Right? So what I'm covering up with my fingertips here completely is the thalamus and the hypothalamus. In the um, and going back to talking about the midbrain, the midbrain is right next to the thalamus and the hypothalamus, okay? right there. Um, then the metencephalon differentiates into two different structures than the adult brain. At the embryonic level, they still look like one thing. Um, there's the pons and the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum is the smaller wrinkly part on the back of the brain here. Okay? Um, it's connected to uh, what we call the brain stem here at the level of the pond. Now the pond is actually fairly easy to figure out on these models. There's this oval thing right in the front of the brainstem, okay? sort of opposite the um, cerebellum. That oval thing represents the cross section of a big uh, white matter bundle, which is what's actually connecting to the cerebellum. And then uh, behind that, so the rest of the brainstem, that's adjacent to that oval. That's all the pond. Okay. Pons has this big white matter structure, and then there's gray matter uh, adjacent to that. And all of that's the pons. Okay. Um, if you want to visualize the midbrain a little bit better, um, at the top of that oval that I just pointed to, that's the pons. Um, so I'm sort of covering that with my finger now. The midbrain is everything that's right above my finger okay, before we get to the uh, um, diet after which is really a kind of small part of the brain. Um, the pons and the cerebellum, again, are what were the metencephalon and the embryonic brain. Um, and this is another place where the embryonic brain helps you understand things. The cerebellum is attached to the brain stem, which is this whole thing, which is the midbrain, the pons, and the other part we're going to talk about in a second. And the biggest connection between the cerebellum and the uh, rest of the brain is at the pons. There's a little bit of a connection to the midbrain, a little bit of a connection to the other part that we we'll talk about in a second. But most of the cerebellum is connected directly to the pons. Now, as you're looking at the adult brain, you might say, well, here's cerebrum right here, and here's cerebellum right here. They're right next to each other, so they must be connected. In fact, they're not. Um, there's a piece of connective tissue that's part of the skull um, that uh, <coughs> physically separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. So there's no nervous tissue connection directly from one to the other. But they do interact. And the only way they can interact is if the cerebellum sends information through the diencephalon, the midbrain, to the pons, and then into the cerebellum, or the cerebellum sends information through the brainstem, diencephalon, and into the cerebrum. So, these two things right here that I can cover both of them with my finger, uh, if there's any interaction between them, which there very well might be, that interaction has to travel back and forth through the structures that we see in the embryonic brain. So if the cerebellum is growing out of this area and the cerebrum is growing out of this area, they can only interact by sending information up and down the tube here. 
even though eventually the cerebrum is going to grow so big that it looks like it's touching the cerebellum. There's no physical connection directly between the two. The only connections have to be through the intervening structures in the embryonic brain. <laughs> which brings us to the last part, which is the medulla or medulla oblongata. Now, I'm never going to refer to it as the medulla oblongata. Um, that's really just for uh, uh, Adam Sandler movies. <laughs> um, there's nothing else in the brain that we're going to talk about that's called a medulla of any sort. So when we say medulla, we're obviously talking about this structure. Um, and it's essentially the part of the brainstem that tapers down and gives rise to the uh, spinal cord, which is going to be attached right here. Um, the Greek word for this, myelencephalon, its root has myel in it, like myelin, um, which is what white matter is. Um, and that's because there's a lot of white matter um, tracts that are going through this area. Um, <clears throat> the only way that the cerebrum commu can communicate with the uh, spinal cord and therefore with the rest of the body um, is by sending fibers up and down the rest of the brain. So information has to travel up and down like this. So as we get down here, um, most of what's passing through this area is um, white matter coming from the cerebrum going to the spinal cord or vice versa, white matter from the spinal cord going up to the cerebrum. Um, so it's named in Greek, recognizing that high content of white matter in there. But we'll just refer to that as the medulla. Um, so that's a basic layout of the embryonic brain and uh, using that to understand the different parts of the adult brain. Okay. So again, as we're looking at it, there's the cerebrum, which is the outer, uh, the cerebral cortex, which is the outer covering of the rest of the cerebrum, which is all of this stuff. And as you look at half of the brain, you can see that the uh, cerebral cortex extends down into um, uh, <clears throat> the brain, you know, covers the outside of the brain, going down into uh, the midline portion until we get to this white structure here, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, and then sort of tucked inside that midbrain, uh, that, sorry, sort of tucked inside that C-shaped C structure is the diencephalon. Mainly what we see is the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then uh, extending down from where the diencephalon is, the rest of this is the brainstem, which is the midbrain, pons, and medulla, and connected to that is the cerebellum. <coughs> So I like to start off with this because it does sort of build up the structure of the brain a little bit um, so that you can see the relationships and understand the connections a little bit better. And then two major things to get out of this, uh, one of which is going to be more important in AMP2, is that the retina is connected to the diencephalon. And then the other thing is that the cerebellum is connected to the brainstem, mainly to the pons, a little bit to the midbrain, a little bit to the medulla, um, which isn't terribly obvious from looking at the adult brain, as those things don't seem to be too close together, um, or those things seem to be closer to other structures. And, but the connections have to go through whatever we see building up the um, embryonic brain at this point. Um, now, I also want to talk about the empty space in the middle. So as we're looking at this, we've cut it open in the first picture, um, and uh, there's empty space in there. The wall is just represented by a thick white line. But that thick white line is uh, where all of these cells uh, are found that are going to eventually divide over and over again and build up the mass of tissue that makes up the whole brain. The empty space... model that I had you grab here is a model representing those ventricles. Okay. Now, uh, the one I have here, actually, now that I look at it, has been broken, which is fine because nobody's looking at this. But um, to me, and you know, it's sort of like an ink plot test. I stare at these things too long and I see weird things. 
to me, it looks like a rooster with a bat with a weird hairdo, right? a pompadour kind of hairdo. Work with me. Okay. So <clears throat> there's this big curved thing that's on top. That's like its hairdo. Okay. And then you can see a hole through the middle, which would be like the eye for the rooster's head. And it comes to a point here, which would be like its beak. And then the parts that's broken off of the one I have uh, extends back like the, ro the rooster's neck. Okay. Um, so you see the rooster head that I'm talking about now? No. Really? No. It should be obvious. See the hole in the middle? I see, I see like an eye. I see <laughs> okay, see the eye. Can you see where when you go down from the eye in that direction, it comes to a point there and looks yeah, kind of like a beak? Okay. There's a beak? Okay. Okay, so that's the rooster's head. And the rooster has this big hairdo <laughs> coming off of it. All right. So, I got a ram. Excuse me? I got a ram. Okay, if you want to be so literal that these things look like ram horns, go ahead. But I'm going with the rooster. The reason I'm going with the rooster is because the beak part is important. So what this is, this is called a um, ventricular cast. Um, this is mass produced so what you're holding here isn't made the way that i'm about to describe it's made um, from a mold of what i'm about to describe so you can take a brain and find the empty spaces in the middle and inject plastic into that and that plastic fills up all the space and it solidifies and takes on the shape of whatever it's filling up and then you remove all of the tissue and all that's left over is the plastic which you've injected into um, stuff in the middle. And that's what this is. And this is essentially a space filling model of the ventricles inside the brain. Right? There are four ventricles. The first two are referred to as the lateral ventricles. And those are the two things that I say is the rooster's hairdo and Amanda says are the ram's horns. Right? Um, they're located within the cerebrum. Okay. Now, in these models, you can't see where they are because they're off, off midline. Okay. But uh, if we were to stick our finger in the brain right about there, it would go up into this little cavity in the middle of the brain. Um, and the uh, shape that we have here kind of follows the shape of the cerebrum. So it starts up here in the front and goes back to a point here, and then it curves under on the side right there. So it has this kind of C-shaped overall appearance with a, a pointy back there. The, um, where those two pieces are connected down to the middle part, um, uh, <clears throat> there are two little canals, which you can't see in your models because they're not modeled for that, but um, where would that be? Right about here, uh, there's a little, there should be a little hole that goes from the lateral ventricle into this space right here. And that leads to what we call the third ventricle. The third ventricle is found in the diencephalon and the mesencephalon. In the uh, diencephalon, sorry, said that wrong. It's found in the diencephalon, which means that it's around the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So the hole that we see in the third ventricle that's where the little colored dot is. So the little bit of the thalamus from one side that's touching a little bit of the thalamus on the other side, that's where the hole is. And then if you go down from that to what I'm calling the beak of the rooster, um, that's where the hypothalamus is. And so if you look at the shape of the hypothalamus, it kind of comes down to a point. And in actuality, uh, especially if you're looking at the hard plastic brain, um, it doesn't come down to a single point. It actually comes down to two points, so it looks like a bird's beak that's slightly open. It's a more realistic representation. That's going on. Um, then uh, if you look back uh, where the third ventricle ends next to the thalamus here, right through where the midbrain is, there's a little groove. Okay? And that little groove is connecting the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle. Um, <clears throat> so the third ventricle is in the diencephalon area. Right here. 
the fourth ventricle is down in the um, pons medulla area around the cerebellum. Okay. So this is the lateral ventricles are up in the telencephalon, the third ventricle in the diencephalon, the fourth ventricle down here. In between the third and fourth ventricle is a space that passes through the midbrain. And that little space in there is called the cerebral aqueduct. Right? Cerebral because um, <clears throat> it's sort of connected to the cerebrum forebrain area, not the most accurate name because the diencephalon excuse me, diencephalon's up there too. But aqueduct, because fluid moves back and forth in there, okay. mostly in one direction. Um, the fluid that we find in there is called cerebrospinal fluid, which I mentioned two weeks ago now that the um, ependymal cells make. Um, so that's where that comes from. Um, <clears throat> now, going back to the book okay so this is the whoops section that's looking at um, uh, the embryonic structures here um, I want to jump ahead for a second to the fourth section which is circulation uh, and the central nervous system because this is where the ventricles are being discussed in the book um, so first off, it's talking about blood supply, but what I really want to talk about is the ventricles here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's a picture showing the adult brain, and these little arrows point out where the cerebrospinal fluid flows through everything. So there's some in, coming out of the lateral ventricles here, and then some in the third ventricle there. It flows down the cerebral aqueduct, to the fourth ventricle there, and then it slips out between the cere uh, cerebellum and the brainstem to get into the space surrounding the brain um, and sort of provides this liquid cushion around the whole central nervous system until it's finally filtered out into the blood supply here to be cleared away. Um, Huh. I thought I had a picture here, but I don't. Um, that kind of summarizes that. Uh, <clears throat> so in here, it's talking about um, how the cerebrospinal fluid is made and how it circulates through these things. Basically, it starts in the lateral ventricles, then goes to the third ventricle, then through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, and then it goes to the outside surface of the brain and circulates around all of that. Um, there is a little connection from the fourth ventricle down into the center of the spinal cord um, because the spinal cord had a hole in the middle of it just like the rest of the neural tube, which is called the central canal. But that's such a small hole, it's not a big player in what I'm talking about here. So really the cerebrospinal fluid mostly leaves the central areas, the ventricle areas, and gets into the space around the outside of the central nervous system. Um, what I skipped over as I was getting down to that picture um, is a description of connective tissue layers that surround the outside of the central nervous system, um, which has to do with um, the blood-brain barrier and cerebrospinal fluid um, circulation. Uh, there's three layers of connective tissue on the outside of the brain and spinal cord. There's the dura mater, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Um, until I wrote this book, I never called this the arachnoid mater. Um, I called it the arachnoid membrane. Um, and uh, it's mater in here because uh, I realized that um, when it was being taught to me, whoever taught that to me just didn't like calling it the arachnoid mater. The reason why is because the word mater means mother. And so dura mater means tough mother. It's a tough, dense connective tissue outer covering over the brain. And then pia mater means thin or light mother. And it's this very thin membrane that covers the very outside of the brain. And so whoever taught me about all this sort of like those meanings there. Arachnoid refers to spiders. 
And so arachnoid mater would mean spider mother, which is not what it means, okay? Not the point. What it is, is the dura mater is this outer covering. It's basically right uh, adjacent to the bone. So here we have the skull, and the dura mater is uh, a thick outer covering next to the bone. And then the pia mater is this very thin line that's right along the edge of the brain. Okay. And then between those two is this area that has a lot of fibers that look like spider webs, hence arachnoid. Um, so as I was taught uh, when I was a student, uh, we called that the arachnoid membrane, but in fact it is more formally referred to as the arachnoid mater, but it's not because it translates to mean spider mother. It's just as a spider webby appearance to it, and then mater is just used to describe these layers of connective tissue on the outside. Um, in that arachnoid space where all these fibers are, that's where the cerebrospinal fluid flows on the outside of the brain and spinal cord. Okay. And then poking up from the arachnoid mater area are these little granules that reach into veins that are contained within the dura mater, and that's how the fluid gets drained off there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this picture just shows those veins um, on midline in relation to the cranial space. Going right down in the middle of the brain where we can see that exposed cerebral cortex, the wrinkly stuff that goes up until that C-shaped structure, there's actually some of the dura mater that extends down in between separating the two sides of the cerebrum. Likewise, there's a similar uh, flat piece of uh, dense connective tissue that reaches out in between the cerebrum and the cerebellum right there. Okay. Um, separate, so the cerebellum would be located right there and the cerebrum ends right there. So there's no actual connection between the two because there's a big piece of dura mater separating the two apart from each other. Okay. But then also we can see uh, the veins in here. There's a vein that runs right around along midline in the top center of the brain and there's one that runs right along midbrain at the bottom of the cerebral cortex there on midline. And then these veins aren't on midline, they're actually up on the edge, um, sort of coming in from the side. And so all of these represent veins that the cerebrospinal fluid can drain out from. The cerebrospinal fluid carries waste products out of the, the nervous tissue and the central nervous system, and it, we end up getting rid of it because it's passed into the blood supply here in these veins and carried away. Um, so that's talking about the veins, what's clearing blood out of the regions of the brain. Blood getting into the regions of the brain are coming through arteries. This section here is talking about the kind of unusual and very specific blood supply into the brain. Um, this is the ventral surface of the brain. It's not in your, uh, what I'm about to talk to isn't represented in the model that you have, but imagine if you're looking at the model for the other half of the model. So you're looking at the underside of the, the brain intact like this. Um, what we're looking at on the screen is superimposed on top of that. Um, these two vessels coming in from either side, um, which are the vertebral arteries, meaning they're coming from the vertebral column, uh, are coming up either side of the brain stem. They come together and make a single artery called the basilar artery, which runs right up midline on the pons. And then it splits into a couple of branches that end up feeding into the circle here, circle being a very loose, loose term, which would be located right around where the diencephalon is kind of exposed. And the branches coming off of that circle are blood vessels that are going up into the cerebrum. Um, the two holes we see right here in the middle that are feeding into that circle up front are the carotid arteries. So um, this hole here and this hole right here, the label is actually internal carotid artery. Uh, the carotid artery splits into two pieces, the internal and the external carotid. Um, and this model here is a great representation of the blood vessel supply. Um, so the vertebral artery that I was just showing you a second ago is going through the holes that we find in the cervical uh, vertebral bone. Okay. 
remember one of the ways that you can tell cervical apart from thoracic or lumbar is that they have that extra set of holes on either side. And those holes are there to protect the vertebral artery as it goes through the neck. Unprotected, running actually just next to the vertebral artery, is the, the common carotid artery, which is this big red thing right here. It's not protected by any of the vertebral bones, it's just running on the outside. Right here, it splits into two pieces, the internal and external carotid artery. The external carotid artery goes to the outside surface of the skull. The internal carotid artery goes into the cranial space and ends up feeding into that circular structure there. That circle is called the circle of Willis, because um, Dr. Willis first described it. Um, but it's an interesting arrangement. Um, blood can flow up the basal artery and in through the carotid arteries and flow any way through this circle that it needs to. If there's something blocking this artery right here, then blood from the basal artery can't get past it. So blood from the internal carotid on that side will get past, will get to it instead. Um, if something's blocking this artery right here, blood from this internal carotid can't get past it, so blood from this internal carotid can. The circle of Willis there basically provides uh, redundant circulation to the base of the brain so that none of these branches coming off are going to lose blood supply when uh, something gets in there to block circulation. Okay. <clears throat> Once we get into one of these branches, so the middle cerebral artery or the anterior cerebral artery or the posterior cerebral artery, if any of those get blocked, then you have a problem. But at least at this stage, all the blood coming into the brain, um, <clears throat> even if there's something blocking the vertebral artery down here, the common I mean, the carotid arteries can fill back through the basal artery um, to get back to this stuff. So none of this stuff is compromised um, thanks to this very strange circular contraption here. Okay. Yes? Well, um, if a blood vessel is damaged, um, blood clotting will speed healing of the blood vessel. So it might not have ever been surgically fixed, but it would have internally healed on its own to some degree. Okay, she's a yell at the doctors and stuff. I told her, like, be careful when she puts her head back, get her hair washed and stuff like that. that yeah, so at the site of the tear, the tissue making up the, the blood vessel wall might be thinner and therefore more prone to tearing again. But... Yeah, um, but it might have been deemed more dangerous to go in and do surgery on it than to let it heal naturally. So, yeah, I mean, all blood vessels can heal to some extent. If it were like an aneurysm and there's a big burst thing, that would never quite heal up. So that'd have to be corrected surgically and hopefully corrected before it burst. Um, you want to go in and if you have an aneurysm, you want to get in there and... Uh, Corrected before you bleed out, because when that kind of thing bleeds out, there's no coming back. Right, and now, like my my stepmother has to have something put into her neck that's right on the side of the carotid artery. Okay. That must be a pretty touchy surgery. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, um, voluntary. Uh, not voluntary. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, elective surgery. Thank you. Um, I mean, she, if she's got to have something put in there, it's got to be put in there for I a reason. Has, I think she has a split disc that's on the nerve, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that could be a that's big problem to deal with. Yeah. Um, if something does happen to the carotid on that side, the carotid on the other side and the vertebral arteries will still supply the brain pretty well, thanks to this structure here. If that's happening at the level of the common carotid and something happens then the external carotid to the outer surface of the skull on that side would have a problem, which isn't going to affect the brain, just the scalp, but um, which isn't nearly as dangerous, but uh, doesn't have that kind of redundant supply. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, usually when we think of blood supply, it's um, 
the arteries are coming together with the veins at capillaries and then um, <clears throat> uh, material from the blood diffuses out into the surrounding tissue, like oxygen and nutrients and those sorts of things, as well as water and um, uh, other components of the blood. Thanks to the blood-brain barrier, that's not happening in the brain. Some components are uh, extracted from the blood at capillaries um, within the brain, like oxygen and those sorts of things that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, or the blood-brain barrier will specifically allow amino acids and um, glucose across. But not just anything can cross over. Um, and uh, most of the water that's getting in is actually coming in as cerebrospinal fluid, which is made by the ependymal cells, which have a sort of incomplete blood-brain barrier around them so that they can get more stuff out of the blood. Um, and so most of the tissue, the extracellular fluid in the tissue of the brain is the cerebrospinal fluid, essentially. Um, and there's not so much coming directly from the blood like you'd see in other tissues. Um, Down here, uh, just to point out, I'm not going to explain it too much. Uh, it's talking about the choroid plexus. This is where those ependymal cells are found that make cerebrospinal fluid. Not just any uh, ependymal cells do it, only the ones associated with this structure here. So you can uh, read the little couple of sentences after that that explain in a little bit more detail. But that's where the cerebrospinal fluid's made. And in this picture, there's a red thing in the third ventricle here, there's a red thing in the lateral ventricle here, and there's a red thing in the fourth ventricle right here. Those are the choroid plexuses, and that's where cerebrospinal fluid is actually being made. So, um, let's see here. Um, so I wanted to start with that embryonic stuff, and from that I got to show you some of the major regions of the brain. Um, and coming from the embryonic stuff and knowing that the tube is hollow, that leads right into looking at the um, ventricles and therefore the circulation stuff. Now I want to go to the central nervous system part. Um, I'm actually not going to really deal with the peripheral nervous system much at all in, tonight. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, the second half of tonight when we're looking at the... Um, uh, cranial nerves, that's in this section here. But what I want to talk about to finish out talking about the neuroanatomy is really just about the central nervous system stuff. Um, <clears throat> I've already run through the major parts, the cerebrum that has the cerebral cortex, um, and then uh, the rest, so the cerebral cortex is the outer covering, and then the stuff that's deep inside the cerebral, cerebrum area uh, we can see here, which are called collectively, in a sort of general sense, the subcortical structures, the things that are deep underneath the cortex in the cerebrum. Um, and then the diencephalon, th thalamus and hypothalamus, highlighting where those are found in the picture here. And then the brain stem, which is the midbrain, pons, and medulla, and the cerebrum, I mean cerebellum, um, which is... Uh, there's this really nice uh, pencil drawing, or I guess uh, pen and ink drawing, of the cerebrum, which uh, I think actually comes from uh, a publicly available or non-copyrighted uh, artwork. So I put that in here. So there's not a corresponding picture like this showing the cerebrum uh, color-coded with the rest of the stuff. Instead, uh, we got a MRI image of a the brain, you can see where the uh, cerebellum is sitting there. And then again, the line drawing of it here, attached to the pons and a little bit of the midbrain, a little bit of the medulla down here. Um, and it goes on into the spinal cord. Now, um, whoops, too far. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight uh, <clears throat> is to finish out the neuroanatomy stuff is really to look at what we see on the surface of the cerebellum, which is this picture and then this picture down here. Um, 
And in looking at the surface of the cerebellum, we can see, oh, actually, I don't want to get to that just yet. Um, well, we can see the wrinkles, and those are um, uh, fairly consistent to, from one person to the other based on the way that the um, brain develops. So I want to talk about some of the landmarks that we can see in the brain models and talk about some specific things that we can see of the brain. The first thing I want to talk about, the most obvious landmark on the surface of the brain is the big um, line going right down midline, which is for our models actually what uh, you can separate the two halves into. That's what's called the longitudinal fissure. Um, it's the crack uh, down midline separating the two cerebral hemispheres. So the cerebrum has a left side and a right side, as does everything else in the body. Um, and as you look at the outer surface of the brain, you can see this big crack right down the middle. That's the longitudinal fissure. If we were looking at actual brains, we could stick our fingers down into the longitudinal, fig longitudinal fissure and pull it back apart a little bit, look down into that crevice. And as we have these models, you can see the cerebral cortex extends around down into that longitudinal fissure. And we see it there. It ends with this C-shaped structure right here, this white thing that I've been pointing to and I haven't named yet. That C-shaped <coughs> structure is called the corpus callosum. Um, which literally means um, scarred body. Not scared body. I've got two R's there. It's scarred body. Uh, callosum, as in callus, that word that kind of means scar. And then corpus means body. Okay. It's a big piece of white matter that connects two hemispheres. Um, so to the first person looking at the brain that could pull the longitudinal fissure open a little bit without cutting into anything, um, saw this big white thing that looked like a big piece of scar tissue across the two, uh, from one side to the other. And that's kind of where it got its name, corpus callosum. Um, but it contains myelinated axons that go from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. Now, um, for the models that we're looking at, we uh, it's like we've taken the brain and we take a big um, knife and just sliced all the way through. If we were actually doing that with a real brain, if we had a knife that went through, we wouldn't meet any resistance as we go into the longitudinal fissure until we get to the corpus callosum. This is the only thing that's connecting this side of the cerebrum with the other side of the cerebrum. So we can come in from any of these directions, and we wouldn't run into anything in the cerebrum until we got to the corpus callosum. Once we get through the corpus callosum, um, where the third ventricle is, there's not a whole lot that we have to cut through there, because the left and right uh, diencephalon is kind of separated by the third ventricle. And then when we get to the brainstem, we cut through that because the brainstem is one continuous thing, as is the cerebellum. Okay. So if we're actually cutting through the brain, the only stuff that we physically cut through is just in this area right in the middle in the cerebellum. Okay. Um, all of the rest of this is separated one side from the other. Now, you've probably heard reference to uh, right brain and left brain people, behaviors, whatever you want to talk about. That's, in fact, not true. Um, <clears throat> functions in the brain are handled in specific areas, and there are some things that are specialized to the right side of the brain versus the left side of the brain and vice versa. But at the level of talking about somebody's personality, it's not segregated that much. Um, I'm going to show you some stuff that talks about the corpus callosum and how it relates to these ideas. And you'll see that there's no 
obvious separation and function between the two sides of the, the brain unless you really press to find uh, functions that you can manipulate that way. But back when uh, people were first studying this, um, <clears throat> people were studied that had the corpus callosum cut in half. So the right and left sides of the cerebrum were separated. Now, I can't guarantee that it's always done for the reason I'm about to explain, but we'll go ahead and stick with the story because it makes the most sense. And it's the most common reason that might happen in the more modern situations. People can have epilepsy, which is uncontrolled electrical activity in the brain. That epilepsy will start, start in a very specific part of the brain and spread out across the rest of the brain. People that have really bad epilepsy, it'll start on one side of the brain and spread over to the other side. And the entire cerebrum will be caught in an epileptic uh, seizure, which will cause lots of problems. The person won't be able to um, lead a normal life because their brain sort of stops functioning on a regular basis. Um, when it gets to the point where it's considered intractable epilepsy, where it's interfering with um, uh, normal everyday living to the point where a person just can't uh, get by at all. <clears throat> Sometimes cutting the corpus callosum in, in half will solve the problem because then the signal doesn't travel around the brain as much and really limits what's happening there. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, possibly when this was first uh, investigated, people were doing it somewhat unethically, um, testing people to see what happened if you cut the brain in half. But the the data I'm going to talk to you about is actually coming from people with epilepsy, and this procedure was performed surgically to help them with the epilepsy. And from that, research followed up on to see what was happening. We're going to see some of what's going on here. Those are called split brain people, and the idea of the left versus right side of the brain came out of those studies. What's terribly unfortunate, those studies never said that we have right side and left side personality traits or functions that are so, solely on one side or the other, rather just that what makes up our personality is a combination of the two sides of the brain together. And we can manipulate things a little bit to separate those functions out. So I want to go to a video because I love my videos. Um, but this is a really good video for this because it's going to show an um, uh, interview with a person that's had a split brain performed. Okay. Um, now, actually, I'm going to go to the um, YouTube page with this. If you ever want to look at one of these videos, um, either here or within a um, uh, makeup assignment, on the embedded video where the title is at the top, if you click on that, it'll take you to the YouTube page. Okay. Um, if you're ever in a situation where you're trying to watch one of these videos, but uh, there's nothing on the page, like in a makeup assignment, I've gotten a few people um, saying they're having problems seeing videos. The videos are all on YouTube. So just look for the title of the video. Okay. So imagine here that we didn't see the video. You just saw the player control button and then nothing below it, and then down here at the bottom. Um, this is the title. You'll always see that title at the bottom of where the video should be. So if you don't see the video, search for that title on YouTube and you'll be able to get to the video right there. Okay. So here it is. Now I'm going here because I want to enlarge it to full screen so we can watch it.